welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to this very special event. It's the celebration of 60 years of publishing the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. So we're thrilled that you're here. Um, and we have some treats. We'll be looking backward and looking forward. Um, and I am Kathy Silva. It's my honor to be the president of the Association of Child, of Child and Adolescent Mental Health, um, which is the name of the parent organization for the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Um, we have lots of treats planned for you, but our speakers have been really warned. They have to really keep within pretty tight time constraints. So I have just three housekeeping messages really quick. Uh, first one is there is no planned fire drill, so if you hear a fire warning, it's real. Uh, the second one is there are washrooms on every floor. And the third one is that we planned a pretty tight program, so when you go for a quick break, uh, please come back smartly. So now, looking forward and looking backward, um, here is the cover page of volume one. And what I think is really interesting, uh, you'll see that the very first editor, one of the editors, was um, Emmanuel Miller. We're having a conference on the 8th of March uh, in honor of uh, Emmanuel Miller. We have it every year because he's one of the kind of founders of the Association of Child and Adolescent Mental Health. Okay, now here, uh, you see our latest, just to give you a sense of the graphic change, but also, of course, the content has changed enormously. Um, the editorial board, and I think you won't be able to see it, sorry about this, um, in the very first uh, volume on the advisory board was Harry Harlow from Wisconsin, Jean Piaget from Geneva, Jean Flood. So, even in the very earliest days, a very good mixture across the disciplines, psychiatry, psychology, and also Gene Flood uh, with long social work and social justice um, history. So now comparing that to the current editorial board, you'll get some sense of the enormous uh, growth in, the, in what we call the factory. Um, and we not only have enormous specialisms now, uh, but we also have a kind of really large management job of such a complex board. And I think we thank Edmund for that. Um, and these are former editors of the Journal of Child's Psychology and Psychiatry. Um, and you'll note many, many people are here today and we're thrilled that they've come to join us in the celebration. So I'm going to hand over <coughs> to Stephen Scott who's the chair of the Association of Child, Psycholo of Child and Adolescent Mental Health, and he'll chair the session. <coughs> Here you go, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Welcome, everybody, to this joyous day. It is amazing to see so many stellar researchers and good friends all in the same room. Amazing. Um, I just wanted to tell you for one minute about ACAM, as we call it, um, as well as the journal, which you're going to hear more about, has a, a sister journal, Child and Adolescent Mental Health for Practitioners, which is doing well. And we are having more events. We always had the Emmanuel Miller, who was a psychiatrist, Jack Tizard, who I think was a psychologist, Mike, um, but, and an epidemiologist. But we've added a third one, uh, Judy Dunn, whose husband, Robert Plyman, is here in the front row. Very excited. We had that in Manchester in the autumn. <coughs> We're trying to widen participation. We, as well as just the professionals in the field, we're having an event, for example, in Sheffield, uh, where we will have Tony Atwood, who's an autism writer, and most of the people coming to that will be parents. So I think we're reflecting a broader interest that mental health, as you know, with the Green Paper in England and everything else, is becoming everybody's business and not just uh, behind closed doors amongst professionals. The other big innovation is that we're having um, lots of words which I can hardly pronounce right, webcasts, podcasts, streaming, webinars. And so whilst we have a number of people in this room, we've got a good thousand uh, in several different countries uh, watching this now live. So welcome to the new world of uh, tweets and Snapchat and everything else. Finally, 
We're not a campaigning organisation, but we do advocate for evidence-based practice, so we are now going to the way of policy so that if the government wants to know what is the evidence on something, we will put forward the evidence of, of what works in childhood using the research published in our journals. So that's where we are, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Eric Taylor, um, known to many of you, former editor-in-chief uh, of the journal, um, and has seen it through many different phases. Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam President, Chair, dear colleagues and editors, I, I've been trying to find out what the technical term is for a collective noun for editors. On the internet, unfortunately, it's always written by the authors who have a bad relationship with editors. So the commonest one is a twaddle of editors. <laughs> I prefer myself an opinion of editors. The, the, uh, the, um, I think the technical term is a redaction of editors. <laughs> a bit of a mouthful. I think in this case, we can quite reasonably talk about a family of editors. The, um, because the... Um, Can we have the next set of slides? The PowerPoint pause is a hallowed tradition of the uh, of, um, academic presentation. The, um, getting over it is another matter. Yes, thank you. Uh, and perhaps we can enlarge it? It's big up there. Is it? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Oh, oh, that's fine. Fine. And so to this, this scribble of editors, it's the, or this family, the, um, it is striking uh, how many of us in the past have cared deeply for the journal. It's been important in many of our lives. It's the, uh, the, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how the impact ought to work between science and clinical practice. How is it transmitted? How should we measure what we're doing? How should we measure what our impact is? And should we modify our practice? The, uh, in the history of the journal, and many of the editors in the past have cared for it enough that they wanted to write these um, these various comments, really explaining what the journal's about and what it's trying to do. So let me point out particularly what Mike Berger uh, wrote with the late Lionel Hauser, which was on the occasion of the 30th anniversary. The, uh, the uh, Dorothy Bishop has done a very scholarly job in editing the cumulative contents of the journal and showing rather graphically what's changed over the years. And the, in the initial uh, stages of it, it was always very broad. It always had a good aim of bringing the scientist and the practitioner into registration with each other. There's more animal behavior then. There was more sociology then. But the big change over the years, as she's documented, has been in more empirical work. And I think this both reflects how the field has changed, and also it reflects the impact of the journal on changing it. So I do want to argue that probably the biggest kind of impact that a journal like this has on the practitioner is creating a discourse. It's creating an atmosphere in which it's possible to think not only of the narrow evidence base, but also the general principle of the reflectiveness and the rigor and the criticism that clinicians need to bring into practice and that the journal does stand for and still does. It does, of course, come in various ways. You have to think of it in various ways. It's quite a complex issue. What kind of practitioners are we thinking about, about in, in influencing? There are the opinion formers. 
And the, the pharma companies have a well-developed industry of how you modify practice and what, the, and what the prescribers usually do by targeting the opinion formers. And there's an industry about identifying who the opinion formers are and of cultivating them. Cultivating them with research grants, with nice travel, with um, conferences. Yeah. On a notch down from the opinion formers, the leaders of the specialty, other specialists, the, uh, the, uh, the senior practitioners, the people who are actually running the services. The ACAM members are a very diverse lot, I'm very glad to say. They, uh, and it's always been an aim of the journal that we're informing the membership. The um, public health, primary care, policy makers, and therapists all have their own different targets and their own courses of how what you read in the journals influences what people do. I don't think it is usually the romantic view that you have a sudden paper which influences everything and everything changes. It really doesn't work like, like, that, like that. It sounds a more complicated. But the, the image that we all have is of T.H. Huxley when he's just read The Origin of Species and he clutches his head and says, how stupid of me not to think of that. <laughs> and that kind of breakthrough moment is not a common event in science. The, the, um, it's much more an incremental process, of course. The, it works in different ways. The influences on the practitioners are very different according to where they come from. What kinds of science are we talking about? Well, there's evidence-based medicine, the immediately practical, the result of a trial, the right of a trial, or the psychometrics of an assessment process. Quite easy, quite easy to uh, monitor and describe the process of that happening. And of course, many people here are doing things very like that in developing their impact statements that our masters increasingly demand of us. Um, there's also the whole question of outcomes and risks, which may not be, have the immediate influence on practice, but I must say, speaking personally, it was very important for me in my early career in this country when I was, when I was starting to introduce um, ADHD into the English clinical com community and to promote the medical treatments of it, that I could look above the head, so to speak, of my immediate colleagues and my superiors and the leaders of the profession and look to the science. And it was that sense of a, another court, a different way of doing things, was very sustaining, very building of confidence. And so for this practitioner, it was, um, it was almost the intangibles. No, no one paper, no one general, but the general process of care, fidelity, and rigour. Problems, of course, matters in the planning of services, and service use and economics is increasingly a research area in its own right. And it does work differently, I think, about how the science influences the practice in different kinds of service organisation. Depends where you're publicly funded, as the NHS used to be. With whether it's a more competitive mixed system as the NHS is, is, is now, or whether it's a, pri a privately funded system. Because different rules and incentives apply in the different phases. And the kind of process of implementation is very often a kind of marketing. And you have to think about what the market is doing. Monitoring what the effect can, can, can be is a correspondingly Complex process. The easy things from citations, from downloads, from the useful altmetrics out, from McMaster relevance, which I will mention, and from whether the, the conclusions of papers are getting into the clinical guidelines, which are what ultimately tends to guide practice. The ACAM members have fed back to us over the years that they want more clinical relevance in what they read in the, in the journal. The, and that was part of the reason for wanting to start the practitioner reviews in 93. And in Jonathan Green's editorial, which 
which before he became the editor, and he was explaining them to enable practitioners to conceptualize clinical problems, frame clinical observations and assessments, and make treatment plans. So it's quite a general brief. It's not just a contribution to the evidence base. Because we do have a variety of means of trying to achieve it in ACAM. As the chair just mentioned, we not only have the journal, we have child and adolescent mental health, which is widely read by clinicians, the bridge, we have special interest groups, we have newsletters, we, have, we used to have occasional papers, podcasts, mind data, and a lot of other different ways in which we try to inform practitioners about what's new, what's good in practice. And a lot of it is trust. Because I think that the brand of ACAM is a trusted source of advice and influence. And it's partly because the journal gives it the credibility of a high regarded scientific avenue. Trust was going to come and, and, and come again, I think, in this discourse. I'm very grateful to Prabha, uh, who's done some very helpful work for me in digging out some of the citation patterns that have been happening. The, um, and there's one way of thinking about it. You know, what gets the prize? What is the gold cup for most cited paper? That's the, um, that's the Bruce Pennington's review. Not a practitioner review, a paper. It's a good paper. Not widely cited in clinical circles, but it is one that comes up on reading lists. So in the education process, which is where practitioners acquire the understanding of the broad outlines of the topic, but I think one can call it um, an influential paper through that. Gold Cup for longevity of citations goes to number five in the total list, which is, um, has been mentioned already, which is a good example of an evidence-based, uh, directly useful paper. It's describing the psychometrics of an important assessment scheme. And in, the, and in current practice, its successor, the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, is one of the key things which is used by practitioners to decide which patients they accept and to decide whether they're doing a good job by according to what the results are. Limited, I think, for that purpose, the, uh, you all know the doubts about whether you can really apply a screening system to a clinical diagnosis the, and whether a restricted number of symptoms is an adequate way of describing outcome of a complex generic service. But that is very much nevertheless the way things are going in this country, especially now with the government producing a lot of money, um, well, a bit of money, uh, the, uh, that, is, uh, that is largely devoted to this kind of thing. It's typically papers writing, describing this kind of thing don't only report the sensitivity and specificity, which are very important, but from the point of view of the clinician, it's very more important to report the positive predictive value than the negative predictive value. Because what the clinician really cares about is, does this questionnaire, which says that this person needs referring to my service, does it really mean that? So it's a positive predictive value, which is often very much lower than the sensitivity and specificity would apply. So the direct translation of evidence-based based medicine definitely needs to be filtered through the judgment of people who've had the broad education which ACAM is trying to do. You can look at the downloads and the gold cup for most downloads is not actually from the journal, it's from the, our sister publication of Child and Adolescent Mental Health. It's a review of physical activity programmes, the 9,000 downloads. Downloads probably are possibly an improvement in marker because conditions do download and, and learn an awful lot from that. But it's not a great marker. And you have to bear in mind this hugely cited uh, paper from, from the Lancet itself, which is, of course, the paper in which Andrew Wakefield announced the cause of autism and distorted practice. So a very influential paper on, on account of autonomy can be a very harmful paper. There are side effects as well of success. Currently cited, the top five 
are mostly anal uh, better analyses. They, um, they, uh, this is in the last couple of years. So they're not mostly practitioner reviews, they're annual research reviews. And it is those reviews which are providing an overall account of what's known that get very heavily into the thinking and directly of other scientists and practitioners. And that's why we're most cited, on the whole, in other journals with a similar kind of emphasis. Now, another limitation of citations was rather trenchantly put by Margaret Thatcher when she was being confronted during a research excellence uh, framework report on the, and the reorganisation of medical schools was under discussion. And people were boasting about the size of their impact factors. And she remarked trenchantly that does it matter how much these people talk to each other? Because, of course, it is, it is not clinicians necessarily who are consuming of this. It's, it's, it's other scientists. They are. They are. The McMaster evidence ratings do try to get a little bit beyond that. It's the, um, the, uh, their system is that for the journals which they scan, including ours, they have an expert panel which rates the extent to which an article is relevant to their clinical practice and the extent to which th the conditions in the rater's discipline are unlikely to know it already. So it's kind of rating of clinical relevance. There. And they publish regularly the McMaster online rating of evidence, which people may, may scan. Those who do scan that um, will be aware that there's not very much child mental health in it. There is some. But the journals from which they select articles on this basis do not include ours. Uh, they're all American journals. They, uh, uh, the Journal of the American Academy is well represented. And in particular, most of the things that they cite are either meta-analyses or guidelines. And I think this does reflect the way that, um, the way that implementation happens. They, um, there are lots of ways of describing that. I'm going to stick to the, to the notion of a process model in which information filters through from science into practice. It is an oversimplification, but it does help to focus thoughts. Now, clinicians are often quite anxious, especially if they're starting a new thing. They, especially if they're doing something which is not in the conventional wisdom. Maybe it's against the funding, the funding outlines of the people who fund them. And the way you get to consensus is quite an official one. I'll give you the example of NICE, which is the British uh, thing, which is laying down guidelines for practice. Not because it's always right, it certainly isn't, but because it's enormously influential. I don't think anyone's been prosecuted for disregarding the guidelines, but several people have had a successful defence in the law courts because their practice could be documented by of an appeal to NICE. So when you get towards consensus, you begin with a generalisation, the kind of thing you'd read in a textbook. You go into a guideline, which is the kind of thing that the, uh, that the senior practitioners will try to follow, which specifies what you have to uh, recommend in a particular instance. You go into the protocols, which are very largely what the administrators and the managers of services expect and run for instance, in, the, in one case, it would be 100% of referred cases are evaluated by a child psychiatrist. It's their, it's their way of knowing whether their, their wishes and their formulations and their targets are actually being met in the clinic. Now, the inferences on different stages of that process are a bit different. At the general level, it starts with a review, a meta-analysis, all published papers, or all papers, all English language papers, or all papers, depending on the practice. And it's not conducted by clinicians, it's conducted by um, experts in systematic review, 
is conducted by the um, people with a special interest in the statistics, including the kind of statistics that I've been talking about, about the, the impact which papers have made as a kind of proxy for quality. The result is a draft of recommendations, including the costs, and that is the raw material for a guideline. It's not the end of it, because there's a next stage, which is very much where an expert panel, a panel of clinical experts, and sometimes scientific experts, but mostly clinicians, uh, are refereeing the process. For instance, in the ADHD guidelines, in the original guidelines, we were confronted by the meta-analysis, which said quite clearly that the best thing to do for ADHD was dexamphetamine. But yeah, cheap, effective, powerful. It was turned back by the expert panels from saying not enough knowledge about adverse effects, presence in the abusing community, the price is subject to fluctuations anyway, and from that come the recommendations, which is nearly on the guidelines, but then that is guide modified to be a guideline by acceptability to users, by economic cost and subgroups. Of course, all those people and all those influences are different when the filter filters down to local factors and individual practitioners, a different set of inferences apply altogether. And then it gets to policy, and when the purchasers decide what to purchase, economic costs, media acceptability, and social critiques are coming very much into the implementation. Sometimes there's filters which are whether what's in the journals is actually getting through into practice. And at the level where it actually happens, of the, of the individual practitioner, where clinical work happens, then it becomes a matter of marketing. In pharma, that's a very well advanced science, business. And there are lots of, at the different levels of that process, First of all, there are the influences on experts. And on experts, the financial conflicts that come in can be, can be remarkably strong. All over medicine. And these are examples where guidelines have been heavily questioned because there's so much fin competing financial interest. The diabetes guidelines, the chairs of the guidelines of six out of the 12 gu gu guidelines were actually members of the advisory boards of companies selling drugs in that area. The, uh, similarly with statins, if we come to the Australian guidelines on ADHD, which is a, a fascinating story in itself, then the, they've repeatedly been retracted because of not being able to trust the guidelines making them up. First of all, the chair was on the advisory boards of Novartis and Eli Lilly. And then because Joseph Biederman, whose work had been cited 82 times in the, in the, in the guidelines, uh, is, was, had the disgrace, not the punishment, but the disgrace of being known to receive undisclosed payments from the manufacturers of Risperidone. They, um, maybe the, it's gone too far the other way. So on this important matter of translating science into practice, NICE has recently disqualified an expert from chairing if they are also people who publish in the field. And so we do need the balance that can and should come from reliable science. So the balance is provided in the well-regarded, the trusted journal still has its lim lim limitations. Um, I'll put them in, in terms of things I've heard. A practitioner may well say, I will wait until there's consensus here. But that's what NICE is, in, is intended to achieve. And when there is a consensus, if that's wrong, and it often is, that may have a deadening effect on the field. I don't have time to read all these papers which again is partly what we try to do in practitioner reviews, though I don't think they're very much read by individual practitioners. I don't trust a field where there's constant changes. Of re 
I've got the slides up here, but they're not on the, on the screen, I think. Can we fix that? at the end. You'll be relieved to hear, Joe. <laughs> I know what it is trying to... Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, I know it's there. But it's, it's not up there. Okay, well, okay. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, but if you'll just leave that for me for a minute, because, because I did want to... question of whether JCPP should be seeking to increase its clinical impact. And there are various ways that it might be done. It might be that the original papers that we have include a simple version, something short, succinct, not with all the uh, conclusions in uh, all the qualifications to conclusions that are in it, but with the broad outlines of what ought to happen, because that's what will be read by the policymakers. And it's the policymakers who will largely determine what happens. I've suggested the, the professional process in which implementation happens at a professional level. Increasingly, increasingly in this country, it's not done at, at that level. The directions of process are done by governmental fiat and by the managers trying to in, 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 in interpret those. So we could do more in the way of making our practitioner reviews simple, short, and punchy. We could do more translations. Use, for instance, uh, child and adolescent mental health more. Use blogs more. Use the, uh, use the ability of reaching people outside the print media, which is a tried and tested way of getting the information into the, the in the charities that I work with now, nowadays. Okay, okay. This is your set of slides, yeah? That's my set of slides, yes. We're just trying to get them up on this, this, this yeah. In the charities that I work with nowadays, It was good, but it didn't last. <laughs> it's, like, it's like some of the papers that you read in the, in the, in the journals. <laughs> I'm just giving some, some examples of the way that nice reviews get, find them, uh, use uh, JCPP papers. The answer is not much at all. They, um, should we maybe prioritise publication of the kinds of papers that have clear and obvious clinical relevance. Trials, meta-analyses, assessment of instruments, published guidelines. That's certainly what gets you into the McMaster high-impact system. Should we have our own rater panel, as McMaster does, of people, of senior clinicians who are rating for relevance and utility? Or should we employ experts on messaging, as the charities I work with do all the time, in order to get to their conclusions, and sometimes they're very feeble research, I have to say, into the minds of ministers and the minds of the senior civil servants? They, uh, sleep loss creates depression and ADHD in children. I don't know if you've seen that current example, but that comes from a very inferior survey done by one of the charities which I'm responsible. <laughs> I apologise. <laughs> Because they understand better than the science does about how you get conclusions to influence policy and therefore practice. So they're all things that we could do, but I think there'd be dangers in trying to chase the indices like that. It makes fashion the goal. I think guidelines are increasingly doing that. They're increasingly making medicine a matter of algorithmic following a chart. And when a problem is complicated, you get out of the realm of what the guidelines can tell you. And then it's when you need the person with a broad understanding of the field, which I hope that education will have given them, and which it certainly will have done if it's included the extensive use 
of the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you, Eric. We're going to have a time for questions after Edmund uh, has spoken. Now, I think Mao Zedong was called the Great Helmsman, but I'd like to pass that mantle on to Edmund, who has been Great what? Helmsman, <laughs> who's, who's been leading our, our journal, uh, Edmund. <laughs> thank you. How do we? <laughs> Eric, how did you? <laughs> how, how did you? I, I called for help. Yeah. From an expert. Yeah. How do we get through to mine? Great. Well, um, yeah, what an incredible honour to be involved in marking the 60th anniversary uh, of the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. And before I start, I'd say, like to say a few thank yous, actually. Uh, first of all, of course, to Prabha and the team for putting on such a great event with a, a wonderful cast uh, of speakers. Um, I'd like to thank Eric for actually some really good ideas that we've got to think about at the journal, but also, of course, for your contribution uh, enormous contribution as a former editor, which also gives me the chance to thank all the former editors uh, here, um, who you know continue to inspire the current editorial uh, group. Uh, you are the shoulders that we are standing on. So that thank you very very much. <laughs> and finally, I, I'd like to thank. Kathy as the president, uh, Stephen as the chair, and Martin Pratt as the CEO of ACAM for their unswerving support of the journal and their confidence in me uh, as editor-in-chief. So thank you very much. Look at that. <laughs> so it is a great opportunity today to celebrate the enormous contribution to evidence-based and science-driven progress in child and adolescent uh, psychology and Psychiatry of the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. But it's also an occasion to take stock. Um, where have we got to as a journal and what are our next steps as a journal? And for sure the next few years are not going to be boring with regard to that. So radical new plans supported by very powerful and influential bodies let's be frank, would like uh, to do away with uh, hybrid-funded journals like the JCPP um, and replace them with a fully open access uh, publishing model. Now, this will change or could change uh, the publishing landscape almost completely in the next five years and, and very few journals will be immune to the upheaval and the uncertainty that this is going to bring. No matter the status of the journal or its state, and you know the JCBP is in rude health, as you'll, as you'll see, so we're well placed to deal with this. But we certainly can't be complacent. Um, we can't assume the, things, the way we've done things in the past is the way they're going to be done in the future. Um, we can't even be sure that it would be possible to do them um, in that way in the future. But we're not going to throw up our hands in despair and give up, of course. In fact, our aim is we're determined to seize the opportunities that this period of flux will bring, both for the field, I think, and, and for the Journal of Child Psychiatry. So some have argued that the days of high added value journals like the JCPP, with strong production and strong scientific values, and exacting editorial standards are numbered. Put out of business by the growth of uh, utilitarian, lower cost, lower quality pay to publish, I'll call them platforms. Um, 
as funders, of course, want to reduce costs and cut margins. Now, we think that's 180 degrees wrong because we believe that authors will increasingly place a premium on journals with a pedigree where they can have complete trust in the offer that that journal brings and where they know the journal will add value to their science. In a similar way, um, we believe that readers will, even more than the, in the past, seek out those journals where they can be absolutely confident about the quality of the work and its veracity. So today is definitely about cherishing uh, our achievements, but I think it's also about looking, um, trying to learn from the way we've achieved those things. And so, um, to paraphrase one of my heroes and the great soul poet of the 20th century, Mr. Smokey Robinson, it's actually the way we do the things uh, we do that's really important. And I've got a to-do list, so do becomes quite important in this uh, talk. The first is what do we aim to do as a journal? What have we done as a journal and our achievements? How have we done those things? Where do the, what's the process by which we've achieved at those things? And what will we do next? And uh, I'll take you through those. So what we aim to do as a journal. Our mission statement uh, was, has been published in a number of editorials and a num number of other documents. But it was, it's been really important to formulate this really clearly uh, for the journal. I think perhaps at the behest of our publishers, Wiley Blackwell, a few years back. So obviously, first of all, our, our goal is to disseminate the very best basic and applied research in mental health and mental disorder and developmental disabilities that is available. And as part of that, of course, to promote science-driven and evidence-based approaches, uh, both uh, to inquiry, of course, but also uh, to clinical practice, to champion methodological rigor and theoretical innovation. And I think these have been two of the core pillars of the JCP's uh, brand since its inception, and it's what it's known for or has been known for in the past. We do aim to increase transparency, both of our own processes, so our decision processes, uh, and the way we make decisions, and uh, the processes uh, by which we come to those decisions are now com almost completely transparent. But of course we want to increase the transparency of the authors that we publish, encourage them to be transparent about their processes, and so to increase repro reproducibility in the face of this reproducibility crisis that we are experiencing. And crucially, we want to maintain a balanced portfolio. And at various points in our history, there's been pressure to narrow, to go more, you know, become a more neuroscience journal, become a more genetic journal, become a, a more trials journal, you know, for, for kind of obvious reasons. But we, one of our defining features is the breadth of what we do. Um, from basic science to clinical practice and in including clinical implementation from uh, a across a range of disorders, a, a range of processes from the social to the biological. So this broad and balanced portfolio is a key defining feature of what we do. As Eric mentioned, we are trying really hard to make specialized and technical science accessible to clinicians. Uh, and also to non-specialist scientists uh, in the field. That is a, a goal. I think we're, we're doing okay, but I think there's further to go uh, with that. We are a truly international journal, and this is a core value for us in terms of our orientation, but also in terms of our values and the content of what we publish, which you'll see in a minute. 
And as part of that, on offshoot of that, we, we, we would like to play some role in trying to nurture research in less established individuals and groups. Never, of course, requiring dropping of standards, but just facilitating that publication process, perhaps for people who are less familiar with those processes. And crucially, and this is our offer, as I mentioned before, we want to be valued because of the excellence, the rigor, the efficiency, the fairness, the integrity, and the ethical values of our editorial decision-making processes. And I think JCPP has always been valued for those things. And as part of all that, in the context of the changes that are going to be happening, we want to be the number one choice in this increasingly dysregulated and, and competitive market. So that's our mission. What's not in our mission? So when people say, you say, oh, I'm an editor-in-chief of a journal, they say, well, which journal? I say, the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. They don't ask me what the mission of the journal is. You know what they ask me? They say, what's the impact factor of the journal? But you probably notice that's not in our uh, mission statement. Uh, some people think of an impact factor as in terms of the holy grail, a high impact factor. That's what we're aiming for. In fact, it's much more likely that it plays the role of the sirens uh, dragging the good ship JCPP onto the rocks, potentially, if it's sought as an end in itself. We are we aware, of course, that authors and readers' impact factor is a proxy for the quality, the visibility, and the importance of their papers. So we can't ignore it. But from our point of view, it's more of an indication that we're doing the right things. So it's not an end in itself, but it tells us, yeah, we're doing the right. People are using our papers. Scientists are using our papers. And we know it drives author choice. So again, we can't ignore it, but it's not an end in itself. And the reason for that is simple, because it might distort our mission. And there have been points where we've had to think about this quite carefully. Being absolutely frank, it can encourage the editorial dark arts of impact factor manipulation. Although, of course, that wouldn't affect us. Uh, but more seriously for us, it could discourage publication of certain types of work. Uh, makes us more, might make us more conservative, less innovative, uh, narrower in scope, and um, perhaps favoring established authors over uh, less established authors, and so working against the development of the field and the generativ generativity in the field. So that's not part of our mission statement. So, so what have we done? Some of the things we've done. We certainly maintain a broad portfolio of research. So this is the word cloud that I generated uh, from uh, last three years. Titles, was it, Prava, you sent me? Last 10 years, my golly. Yeah. No wonder it took me ages to put them all in. Uh, right, OK. Uh, yeah, so you can see there, we, we cover pretty much everything. In every issue, you can see an enormous range of different areas, different disorders, different methodologies, different focuses, foci, and so forth. We do have widespread usage. This is the trajectory for the impact factor of the journal since 2004. And you can see our impact factor has pretty much doubled uh, over this time. But there is an interesting phenomena, which is um, widely now in the publication world, I hear, is to called the Chinooga Bark Effect. And uh, so you see a drop. You see, and when I started, there was an immediate drop as uh, Tony Charman handed over the, uh, the baton to me. But I, I, I gradually figured out what we were supposed to be doing, and you can see <laughs> that we improved. And crucially here, uh, obviously, the context is important, and this is the ranking of the journal. So we are now ranked first amongst all the developmental psychology and psychiatry journals uh, over that period. Um, another measure of usage, which Eric mentioned, is downloads. And so that's not usage by authors, but it's usage by readers, perhaps clinicians, students. And so we have seen an enormous increase in downloads. So we've hit a million downloads uh, now, I think, in 2018. Um, so that's another important uh, metric. So we might have uh, reached asymptote in terms of impact factor. It'd be hard to go much higher, I think. But certainly in terms of other usages, we're, we're working on that broadening that usage. Um, in terms of global reach, 
it's interesting that in the last three years, and this is crucial, and very interesting, I guess, for the people on the, web, uh, the webcam, that in the last three years, authors from 49 different countries have published in the JCPP. And you can see the breakdown across the different countries. Um, uh, so this is the last three years, the majority from North America, certainly Britain, but you can see people from Africa, Latin America, Southern Europe, the Far East, and so forth and so on. So very broad family, if you like, for the JCPP. Uh, just focusing on these three areas, because you'll see they vary in relation to my next slide. So that's Scandinavia, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, and the Far East, which includes Japan and China and so forth. So the next slide, then, is the global reach in terms of readership. So in the last three years, uh, there have been more than 1,000 downloads in 73 different countries. Again, data supplied by Prava. And so there's the breakdown again. Many, a lot of it looks a bit similar to the authorship. So I, I don't think it's just that the authors are getting their families to download the... Well, that, that is a hypothesis we haven't tested, so probably ought to look into that. Uh, uh, but I just highlight these three because they're in a different order than on the authorship one. And it just highlights the really increase in, in interest in the JCPP and mental health in the Far East in particular. China and, and Japan has really grown as a, as a consumer of our work. Now, we do have some markets we're trying to break into. Um, and so over the, last, over the last three years... Oh, it gets better, don't worry. Over the last three years... Uh, we have one download in the Vatican City. Now, that was such an auspicious occasion, we in fact sent a photographer <laughs> uh, <laughs> along. His Holy Father um, uh, was uh, uh, doing a ceremonial download uh, of a paper from JCPP. And uh, I, I was, we asked what it was about, and he said he had to find that Pasco Fearon editorial, partly because he was trying to work out what the title meant. <laughs> <laughs> so we're also uh, very active on social media, uh, our, our metrics patterns across time, uh, across a range of different, you can't probably, oh, you can probably read them better than me actually on there, but we've got blogs, tweets and so, so we're still very active and if you just cut that little bit out the bottom, so the bottom timeline is since, I don't know, it looks like about 1800 but it can't be. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Anyway, so you can see an enormous increase in activity. And I'd just like to highlight this gentleman who you probably might have met today. So Matt is our guru on the social media and brilliant at getting the exposure for, for the journal. And I think uh, uh, he's been superb for us in getting at, at raising our profile. We're also mentioned uh, in uh, policy uh, work considerably. So in uh, 2018, we had... Um, 68 uh, policy mentions, these are some of the, the uh, reports, and right across the world, certainly not just in the UK. Uh, I'm not going to obviously run through them all. So how do we get there? How do we uh, achieve uh, what we've achieved in terms of the reach of the work, uh, and the usage of the work, and, and the influence of the work? Well, I'm a great believer in virtuous, creating virtuous uh, cycles. And in our virtuous cycle, in at least the recent virtuous cycle, the, the, I think yeah, it's a tr probably a tri or qu qu quattro cyclical journal, but this cycle was establishing the multi-editor model. And so I would just like to highlight these three visionary people. Um, I don't know if Jim Stevenson's here, but I know Frankie's here, obviously, because he's going to speak. Uh, and Frank Verhurst, I don't think, is here. But they were the three editors, and I think it was around 2003, and they had this incredibly good idea to actually uh, appoint, uh, I think it was seven editors, to the next round rather than three, and to identify editor-in-chief. Um, and that meant, of course, apart from dividing the workload, that meant, of course, um, getting close to these specialist areas, knowing your area, knowing the authors, uh, knowing the reviewers, now that's, a, that's quite a challenge, as people know. So it was a great idea, and I think we owe the, actually these three people an awful lot for, for that idea. The second stage in the virtuous model is, of course, you've got the model, you've got to appoint the editors. So you need to appoint great editors. And I actually think that's the most important thing the editor-in-chief does, is, is work with the other editors to identify new people and then persuade them to take on this job, because it's a big job. And we do have, oh sorry, and also create a great 
publications team. Sorry, and we do have a great publications team. Uh, I think probably the best in the world, I should imagine. Uh, we do have wonderful editors. So just highlight Pasco Firon, who's a deputy editor in chief, and these are our, our review editors. I'm not going to go through all of the names because you'll see it's a lot of people. And then we have thematic editors. So, for instance, neuroscience, molecular genetics, behavioral genetics, statistics. So, I mean, just look at the people we have. I mean, how can you not enjoy working with these wonderful people uh, and be inspired by working with them? And then we have condition specific editors. So, in total, we have 20 editors, plus me, 21 editors now. Uh, and I have to say, it works wonderfully, and it's a great privilege to lead, lead these wonderful uh, scientists and colleagues. The second stage then, of course, is to put the people in place and then work tirelessly to improve your offer and the reputation of the journal. And one of the things people care about most is how quickly you can make decisions. And so this is a pattern showing the changes in our decision times uh, over the last period. And it is a testament uh, to the efficiency of the office, to the industry and expertise of the editors, uh, and also to uh, the multi-editor system, but also to a, 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 I suppose a, a tactical, you might say, almost dignified with strategic a decision uh, in, a, in about uh, 2009, 2010, where we decided to introduce a much stronger triage system, where we now triage about 50% of papers in the first two or three days. Um, and uh, that is the editor-in-chief's responsibility. Uh, in consultation with the other editors. Um, but even without the, the, those triage papers, we are around 33 days for our average decision time. So it is, it is, and again, I don't think we can get quicker than that without losing the quality. And this is our offer we make now. We, we offer, we, our main thing is we will get the decision back to you within 60 days at the most. And we hit that 95% of the times now. And so that's what we're really pushing for. Yeah, I'm okay for fine. So, work tirelessly. That, of course, then, I don't know if people can, yeah, you can see it better than me again, increases the number and quality of submissions, increases the reach and the impact of our papers. That, of course, makes it easier then to appoint great editors. Um, uh, and we do have two new editors. Uh, we have Scott Collins from Duke University, who's taken over from Jeff Halperin for ADHD. And we have Helen Fisher from King's College London, who's taken over from Chris Hollis on psychosis. They've just both started. And we have two, uh, we're looking for two, two people at the moment, uh, one in emotional disorders and then one in molecular genetics. And then, of course, that, the whole thing goes around again. And this is the virtuous cycle I think we've created. So what will we do next? Uh, as I said, it's going to be a very interesting next few years. Um, we are thinking about the developmental scope of the journal, thinking about whether to extend the traditional um, boundaries at childhood, adolescent, into emerging adulthood, perhaps moving our upper boundary to 22, 23 as a, as a, as a, as a range. We are always looking to broaden our editorial expertise and the areas, even with that core new copia of talent, there are areas where we don't have expertise uh, and we may appoint further specialist editors. We're looking as, um, I think Stephen mentioned, that we're looking to work with ACAM to influence policy through evidence. Um, and we have set up a, a strategic, I don't, can't remember what it's called, Stephen, but it's something like strategic policy committee, which I am a member of, uh, and that the idea there is and, and looking to appoint strategic policy officers to work together to try and have an influence outside the normal scope of our influence. To, uh, not mentioned it yet, to address the reproducibility crisis. We are, this is obviously very actively uh, in our thoughts, as it is in all journal thoughts. We have decided not to go to um, the uh, uh, registered report model for the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. We don't think that's our best role, uh, given the availability of registration platforms uh, more widely. We do now demand uh, registration of all randomized trials, whether or not they're clinical trials. We will be requiring registration of all reviews, uh, although that's going to take a little bit of time to, to shape up. 
Uh, and then we're also going to implement uh, some, this was discussed actually simply just actually yesterday in an editorial meeting. Uh, we, we, we agreed to implement some sort of way of getting people to record uh, a record of, of, of initial hypotheses uh, and statistics plans, uh, either on supplementary information or, or in some other way. And we've got to respond to this open access revolution. You could have, some might put crisis too there, but we'll call it revolution. Um, there's so much uncertainty, many discussions between funders uh, and uh, journals and publishers and professional associations, because it's actually those associations that are probably going to be hit hardest by the finances of, of this. Um, uh, but the bottom line, and it is actually a bottom line in this in this sense, is that the unit co the unit cost, the unit price per article is almost certain to be reduced quite significantly over the next few years, no matter what solution is come up with, which will inevitably have major consequences for ACAM, um, given that we are a major source of income for ACAM. And so we are working to find creative solutions uh, that on the one hand do not uh, undermine the value of our brand, which of course is, is the most important thing to us, and the quality of what we do, uh, while still trying to um, uh, mitigate against those financial problems that th that could bring to the association. So very quickly, uh, just a, two or three upcoming uh, highlights from the journal. So we have, and great to see uh, Mike here, we have a virtual issue uh, that celebrates Mike's contribution to the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. And Mike probably knows this, but I guess not many other people in the room know this, is he actually has published 99 papers in the Journal of Child Psychology <laughs> and Psychiatry over the years. And so this special virtual issue, we invited all the editors to identify papers that influenced them. And uh, then they wrote a, a commentary, and then Pasco and I have written a, an overall editorial. We did have the old thesaurus out looking for more and more superlatives. It was, it was, uh, it was fun to write, for sure. Um, but what we really struck by, actually, is that we only really covered about 60% of Mike's the influence he's had on the field. So we're going to have a volume two, probably. So you might receive an email asking for a comment. Uh, we've got the annual research review, which is, as mentioned, Eric mentioned it, I think, previously, and uh, coming up in April. Again, this really gives a sense of the scope of what we do. I mean, there are stuff on basic neuroscience right the way through to implementation science and everything in between. And then finally, I'd just like to give a plug to a very special, uh, spe a very special, special issue, <laughs> special issue squared, uh, on self-harm and, sub, uh, and uh, suicide that Joan Azanar, who as you know is a, a world-leading expert on suicide and one of our editors, and Dennis Ugren, who is the editor of CAM, have put together, and this is absolutely a stellar uh, piece of work, so I think it'll have a, a defining influence on that field uh, as we go forward. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. Anybody have any questions about this process? Well, I'm going to kick off um, uh, possibly with both of you. Hopefully, if you press the button, it will yeah, work it for you. Yeah. Um, as a clinician, of course, I'm interested in, in things that change practice, but I'm a bit worried that, that pure blue sky science might be dead from what you're saying in, in this kind of a journal. No, I don't necessarily think that's the case. No, I, 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 th I don't think it's the it's the it's the blue sky nature of the science. I think it's simply the publishing, the publishing model that's that's the that's the that's the, that's the threat that's going to be the challenge. Um, and uh, I think it's not opening access is the headline motivation. I'm not sure that's the main motivation many of these uh, of these challenges but our key uh, response has to be 
to maintain the quality of what we do, even under those financial constraints. And um, so we are thinking, for instance, and this is very early on in the process, about a, a new, a, a, a launching a new open access journal, which wouldn't be a <coughs> mirror journal, but would be a more specialist journal uh, rather than a general JCPP uh, journal as a way of trying to balance those, those priorities. But I say that's really very early on in the thinking process. Thank you. Jonathan. It seems to me that the this thing about the um, open access revolution, a lot of it revolves around quality assurance and stroke peer review and the place of peer review in quality assurance. And, um, you know, I may got it wrong, but it seems to me that part of the push is to say, actually, we don't need quality assurance so much as market um, forces to... Uh, kind of um, uh, like select out what's going to work or not. Mm -hmm. And um, I see that as a major threat to our uh, ethos and feel generally. And I wondered, um, and it seems to me that, you know, one of the values of JCPP and other quality journals is simply around the quality of peer review. Now, of course, it's the least worst system we've got to assure quality. You know, we all know that. There are lots of problems with it. But... I wondered whether Edmund or others would like to comment on um, how we could how we can put a metric to peer review. If there's a way of sort of um, justifying the peer review process as a way of quality assurance within the scientific mm -hmm. literature, because I think that's what's going to be a threat under threat. Gosh, that's a good question. I actually don't think, uh, and as a former editor, Jonathan, I'm surprised you focus just on the peer review. Because peer review adds a lot of value. But I think what quality journals add is the editorial processing, that where the peer review is integrated and synthesized and fed back, and then the, the papers and the re are revised and improved. So I would say they're both, they're mutually um, important in the process. A metric, ironically, I wonder, it's not meant to be a cute answer, but I wonder whether the market might actually sort this out uh, anyway. Uh, not the marketing papers, but the marketing actually um, buying or uh, engaging with journals because I think, as you said, I think, and as I said in my intro, in introductory remarks, I think people want a kite mark of quality and those are the journals they'll go to. So that actually, if, it's, if, it's, if there is some openness and, uh, and uh, freedom in that market, then and people will gravitate to those high quality journals anyway. Uh, so I, I don't think we need, I, I'm not sure, a me I don't know what a metric would look like, but I'm not sure it's even necessary. Uh, I might be completely wrong, <laughs> but that's, that's certainly what I feel about the whole process. I think the way that Ma the McMaster system has tried to assert that is to look at the relationship between their ratings of relevance and novelty and see what that does to the impact, overall impact factor of the journal. So the impact factor of the journal is their, their gold standard of the workability of their system. It's an interesting attempt. Mm. But as is famously said, you can't buck the market. But yeah, the market is winning, certainly, certainly in the clinical world. So what people do nowadays is very much more, very much more made into algorithms than it ever used to be. The, the individual things about judgment, which can certainly be abused, have declined considerably in importance by comparison with are you following the guideline? It's what the, and I think that's very dangerous. Yeah. Emma's already referred to the problems of fashion and uniformity. What, well, fashion? It's fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm a very old, I am an old fashioned bloke, and, and I do think that you can't actually uh, um, beat appointing great trusted people into the editorial process. You trust them, you appoint them because of their expertise and their values, 
and there has to be some. You can't, you can't take that out of the equation, I don't think, and just somehow quantify that. And that's why I think we're very lucky at JCPP with the quality of editors we've got. Isabel. Mm -hmm. Thank Hello. you both very much. Um, I just wanted to come back to the dreaded impact factor. So both of you were you know, moderately sceptical, not to say disparaging, but the paradox is that academics and universities are obsessed by impact factor, yet journals and editors I'm mostly like you. So how, how do we ever square the circle with this if it continues to be held in such high esteem by universities and individual academics? I think you have to educate your managers. <laughs> well, I suppose there's two questions. So one of them is about the value of a, a, a citation. What does a citation mean? Because obviously impact factor um, is uh, an aggregate of citations against number of papers published. So is a citation, does a citation have value as a quality metric? And that's even unclear, but I would say it's, it certainly should play into a, a model of, of quality of a paper. The next thing is uh, when they're grouped at the level of a journal, does that have value? So they're two separate questions in a sense. And I think the move, and Wiley Blackwell sitting right behind you there, uh, I think they, they, they certainly feel that the journal impact factor will become less important in the new situation, and it will be the, the, I, it's the article level metrics that will become more important, actually, uh, from now on. Um, good or bad thing for JCPP? I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, no, thank you. Question. Okay, last question from Emily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just following up on that theme and really thinking how do we educate our managers because um, in the UK now, of course, we're, we have the next um, cycle of REF coming up and there were very strong views last time about what journals automatically, amongst our masters, would automatically get you into the four-star arena and which ones would get you into different arenas. And I have to tell you that um, a number of us needed to do educating that JCPP didn't put you in three star, but might well put you into four star if that's at the least, way you were thinking. At least four star. Well, rem remember that's four star is your top. No, no, I was just oh, yes, teasing. <laughs> so, and, and one of the challenges of that whole system, of course, is that my experience on the REF panel was, in fact, that people doing the rankings. Um, had very different, much more open views about articles as opposed to where they were placed. But none of that gets fed back because um, the feedback to universities is at an aggregate level mm. rather than an individual level. So there's no part of that cycle that allows you to challenge the false beliefs of our managers, as Eric said. So we need to think about how we help make that process more transparent amongst ourselves. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got a break now for quarter an hour. Can you come back at four o'clock? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>